Don't undervalue yourself. Please don't tell me or anyone else, or especially yourself, that you're not smart enough or good enough to do anything in this planet. Again, if you've gotten through a baccalaureate degree in nursing, you can take on the world. Greetings and welcome to When the Moment Chooses You. I am your host and Happy New Year. Oh my gosh, Happy New Year. This is actually the first episode that I'm recording and I am extremely excited and absolutely honored to have Dr. Quinlan here today. And she is actually going to introduce herself, but I am looking forward to this conversation. This conversation. So thank you so much, Dr. F Quinlan, for coming. What would you like me to call you? Please call me Phyllis. Okay, Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> I always ask because, you know, my uh, I was brought up in the South. And so we were taught to address people by their Mr. Mrs., you know, things like that. So I want to honor you in that. So Phyllis, oh, tell us that. a little bit about you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I have been so excited since you invited me. And to find out I am your first episode for 2023 is a real honor. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I know that your target audience is essentially professional caregivers, um, nurses, and some of our interprofessional colleagues. Um, I started out as a social worker. So wow. I <clears throat> was a psychiatric social worker for about 20 minutes before I realized <laughs> that really nursing was my vocation. Um, I was doing my internship when I said, you know, I really enjoy my degree in psychology. I really enjoy my degree in sociology, but I am um, looking at my, the, the psychiatric population. And I'm thinking that maybe I have something different to offer other than the conventional social work role and scope. And I immediately went back and got my baccalaureate degree in nursing. I thought I was going to be the world's greatest psychiatric nurse. Um, but when I went through my capstone, uh, I was placed in uh, critical care emergency trauma, and that was the end of my psychiatric nursing career. I, oh, wow. um, yeah, but I never, never looked back because as you can imagine, <clears throat> in critical care emergency trauma, you're, you're using a lot of that, um, those skills, that skill set, that knowledge. So it was never money wasted or time wasted. And of course, learning is never wasted. So I started my career at, in critical care and then moved on to emergency trauma. Uh, then, you know, slowly went up the assistant nurse manager, you know, director, educator position and in and around managed care, which was um, in the late 90s. Um, I found myself in a, in a very different market. Um, the long term care, subacute care venues we're really very rapidly transitioning into med search hospitals and the staff and the organization was really not prepared for the acuity that they were receiving at the time. So I went into education in those venues, ultimately went into be chief nursing officer in those venues. And, um, you know, just really, it's almost like your career took you it, yes. or chose you. You didn't yes. exactly choose it. Um, I always thought um, the universe gives me assignments and I say yes or I say no, mostly yes. Um, so it's been a very interesting career in a variety of different venues and a variety of different roles. And I, I think that's a wonderful thing to say for a 45 year career. That is an absolutely wonderful thing to say, 45 years. So you are an expert in so many different areas. Well, I know, I know a little about a lot. I don't know a if little. I'm an expert, but I'll, I'll, I will absolutely claim to know a little about a lot. Okay, that sounds great. Well, you know what really attracted me to you, Phyllis, was I was, as I was preparing to launch this podcast, I was looking for change agents and trailblazers that really disrupted something within, you know, their career. Like you said, you've been in nursing over 40 years. So how was it that you transitioned to consulting? Because you also do consulting, correct? That's right. I started my company, MFW Consultants, back in 1994. This is my 29th year of oh. being in business. And I am, um, it's really a notch in my belt. I'm very proud of the fact that for someone who never took a business class in her life, <laughs> you know, in preparation for opening her own business, um, I've been able to keep my organization and my firm and grow it um, over 29 years. And wow. um, it's it's something that feeds my soul. 
Um, and I think you understand that with your podcast, you know, you have your conventional life. We all have many lives. You have your conventional life. I have mine. Um, but there's, there are things that you do as you get older, more competent, more confident. You want to stretch your wings. You want to go in places that conventional practice venues don't necessarily offer you. Um, and since the majority of my career was in education, I felt that I was able to venture forth, so to speak, in a uh, consulting firm. And I started my consulting firm by offering education to meet the demands of managed care when we were downsizing, right-sizing, service lining, cross-training. Right. Um, I'm here in New York, and that all started uh, around 1993, late 1993 into 94. And here in New York, um, we the governor at the time put up a lot of money because nobody wanted anyone to lose their jobs. But, you know, we were cross-training the world. Right. And we were doing away with med surge and upgrading to telemetry, critical care and other venues, specialties. And um, our uh, collective bargaining uh, organizations also had money for cross training. So there was a bucket of money and no trainers. So the call went out and I said, here's an identified gap. I think I can fill that gap which is a fundamental need for any market with a product. Do you have a market? Is there a gap that you can fill the unique need for? So I started sending out letters and making phone calls. And um, if I needed to bring in a colleague to help teach or train, uh, I did that as independent contracting. And um, I did that for the cross training specifically around managed care, probably 94, up until about 98, 99. Wow, Phyllis, that is amazing. You know, you said something important and I absolutely understand what you mean. And I'm no- noticing also with some of my other colleagues that they're they're not in a good place because they, they're not feeding their soul. And so the critical piece that you said about feeding your soul, I think is so important because that is why I did the podcast. That is why I do other things outside of work to make sure that I'm feeding my soul so that I can be that full balanced person. So I'm wondering though, Phyllis, um, before you actually launched into your business, what can you tell me like, what was, was, what were you more passionate about when you, when it comes to nursing? And at the bedside in particular, the the clinical specialty that was had my, yeah. my passion the most. Yeah. Uh, the emergency department has always had my passion. I am an emergency department nurse down in my socks. Um, I love the responsibility of triaging. Um, it takes a very unique personality for emergency nursing. Nursing, what I used to say was nursing on the first floor is very different than nursing upstairs. Um, And because you need to be very comfortable with your assessment skills, your interpersonal skills, um, and so your screening skills for abuse, neglect, trafficking, all of that, Um, you really need to know what you're doing because it's the last great generalist specialty. You need to know everything from prenatal care, birthing babies to wrapping bodies and everything in between. There is no specialty in cardiac (laughs) respiratory because it's everything. It's head to toe from neuro to orthopedics and eyes and, you know, uh, OBGYN. Um, I just loved not knowing what's coming in next. I loved being challenged with, um, you know, really testing my, 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 my confidence and my competence in my, in my specialty. I just love the thrill of it. I guess I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. Yes, you are. <laughs> So, I think that's no, why I went into the NICU. You. No, <laughs> you always want to re- apologize for the fact that when you when you heard there's a trauma coming in, y- you perked up. You know, I mean, yes. because of course that was at the expense of some poor soul. But but you you get the idea. You knew yeah. that there was a sense of readiness, and you had something to offer. And I enjoyed teaching emergency nursing too. The second piece to that, and again, I, I think it's my Gemini nature. The on the other end of that continuum, I really enjoyed. Um, geriatric nursing, mm. which had nothing to do, had to do with, you know, emergency nursing, had no. everything to do with quality of life and interpersonal skills. And in many cases, acting as um, uh, extended family and helping people transition with a sense of love and loss, and then working with those families 
who happen to be adult children. Um, I, I really loved the challenge of that venue. So at one end, emergency trauma, the other end, long-term care. That's wonderful. So yeah. over the years, um, Phyllis, now, I know you know a lot about the profession and where we are right now as a profession. And I'm just wondering if I can kind of glean a little bit of wisdom from you. So I may have a nurse that's listening even right now or a healthcare provider that's listening. And they're kind of in that spot of burnout, um, Phyllis. What would you encourage those nurses or those healthcare workers with now in the times that we're living in? So th there's two pieces to that, Charlene. You know, if someone's feeling a sense of burnout, it's time to, it, it's important that you don't try to endure or find grit and hunker through. That is the worst thing you can do because you're really already on fumes. So there's nothing to hunker down to. You, you've, you, you've went from endurance to, to, um, you know, over endurance or, or, you know, mega endurance. And this is part of those reasons. It's a time to be quiet. It's a time to be introspective. I have found that people who are trying to navigate through burnout, and I've been one of them, um, have lost their connection to mission and purpose. And yes. it's a time where you really want to lean in and say, okay, what does nursing mean to me? Um, what am I currently doing? Why do I not feel this connection? And what I have found with my coaching clients is the loss of the connection centers in and around the choice of isolation as a coping mechanism. Mm. So that nurses and other professional caregivers are, we're intended to leave, to lead our lives heart open. Right. That's where our empathy and compassion come from. And that's a very strong choice. A lot of people will say, well, you're very sensitive. Well, no, that's actually a choice and it's a courageous choice because then you feel everything good and you also feel the not so good. Right. The thing is you can't do, you can't live your life with that kind of heart openness if you don't put healthy boundaries around yourself, if you don't um, take care of yourself, body, mind, and spirit. So that, you know, there's a difference between living a life courageously and living life foolishly. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that that's going to expose you in a manner in which you are choosing so that you can be open to the needs of your patients, your profession, and so on. But you have to take good care of yourself so that your caregiving <clears throat> doesn't go to the dark side of self-sacrifice. Yes, that's and great. When it goes from when 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 you you give and you give and you give regardless without good good choices, without using good discernment and healthy boundaries, you're going to find yourself trying to fix rather than being therapeutic. And when you start fixing, you get used up in other ways and the next thing you know, you are enabling and then you go into self-sacrifice and when you sit in the resentment of self-sacrifice, the decision is then, let me choose isolation because I can't live like this anymore. Let me shut down when nurses are really supposed to be opened up. So wow. you choose sh shutting down, you shut down your heart center, your compassionate nature, and you move into your head and you still give world-class care. You still stay at the top of your game. You're still a good colleague you know, but you are more robotic. And once yes. the robotic piece comes in, because you're in isolation, then you start to really stretch the tether of mission and purpose until it snaps. And then we have burnout. Right. Wow. You just like said a mouthful and I don't even know where to start to unpack <laughs> some of it, but the self sacrifice, I would love for you to go in a little bit more on that. What does that actually look like? So, you know, I say this uh, in my lectures and I, uh, you know, nurses were never meant to be helpful. Okay. And people stop and stare at me when I say that, <laughs> but we were never meant to be helpful. We're meant to be therapeutic. We can't do the work for our patients and their families. You know, you can't undo the head trauma. You can't put back a limb from complications of diabetes. You can't undo a diagnosis of of cancer. Um, but what you can do is work with the patient and their families to 
find a place to be of acceptance and thriving in their new reality, regardless of what the universe has served up as their new reality of life. Mm-hmm. When you, when see, we, we get such a kick. We, we, we actually get a, you know, a, a little squirt of a hormone, a feel good hormone, hormone when we are helping because that's, that's our nature. That's on our DNA. Right. But almost like an addiction, okay, when you you offer and you offer and you offer and you don't put healthy boundaries around that, then you're then and people will come up to you and they want you to fix the schedule, they want you to fix this, they want you to fix that, but they don't want to do the work, they want you to do all the work. Or they have disruptive behavior. Perhaps you have a staff person who is, you know, is just chronically uncivil, can't get to work on time, can't complete their work. You know, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Or you have a family member who's also a, a little on the uncivil, abusive side of using up all of your good nature and patience, and you keep digging down to find more, and they keep taking and disrespecting the gift you're offering them. Then you are really enabling. You're not being therapeutic. You are enabling the dysfunction of a loved one, a family member, a patient, and or their families. That it was never what we were meant to do. We were meant to hold the space of strength so we could emanate the strength to the patient and their families so that they could, could almost get a little bit of transfusion of strength to find solace and acceptance in their new reality and then thrive to the degree they could thrive in that new reality. You can't do that work for people. And those of us who have either tiptoed around the drain of burnout or have actually burnt out, um, have abused that, that we've lost sight of that and we become fixing and enabling as opposed to therapeutic and supportive. Wow. That's, well, that is really good. Um, so therapeutic, being therapeutic, what would you say though? Like somebody's stuck, Philly, somebody's super stuck. I know at least... I can't even tell the number of them, but they're stuck and they feel like there's nothing other than what they're doing now. What would you say to those people that are actually stuck and think that this is it? I have to be right here at the bedside. Uh, and we're speaking about nurses. Nurses in okay. particular. So, you know, my 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 share with them would be of all the baccalaureate programs in the United States, the baccalaureate program for nursing is the most difficult, the most complex. Not pre-law. Law is a graduate program, not pre-med. Med is a graduate program. Nursing is a baccalaureate program. You're expected to come out and hit that ground running after a baccalaureate program. You can enhance it with a, a, a master's degree. But it's the, the intense preparation to become a baccalaureate prepared nurse is, is quite the journey. And when you come out of that, you should not only <laughs> collapse on the couch because you finally <laughs> did it, you know, but you should celebrate that you just navigated successfully the, the hardest baccalaureate degree in the country. And now right. you're going to sit down and take a licensure exam on top of that. If you are the person who has done that, you can do anything you want. All right. I love that. You can do anything you want. So if you want to bake cookies and open up a bakery, go for it. If you want to, you know, take a look at the marketplace and say, where is there a gap? Where is something either not served or underserved? And do I have the passion, not the ability, the passion to fill that gap? Because you can't start a business out of just you know, the, the knowledge of it. You have to have some Ghana. You have to have some skin in the game that this matters to you yes. because your potential clients need to feel that passion. Um, but if you, if you do that, there shouldn't be anything, um, on the table that a nurse should hesitate to say, I don't know if I could do that because you've, you've done the big work already. Right. And you should, you should springboard off of that completion off of that achievement to realize you could take on anything at this point. Yeah, I love that. And I love that empowerment. And um, I'd like to know, Phyllis, when you started your business, were there any barriers that you faced when well, starting the business? I, I, you know, the, the obvious one, I'm a woman. Okay. So um, there wasn't, no one was going to give me a loan or anything of that nature. I had to 
you know, put some money aside, what we call seed money, you know, to kind of start a business. Um, I, again, I never took a business class. So I had to start to, and I think this is, I think Charlene, this is the big takeaway for nurses who are looking to become nurse entrepreneurs is that you cannot start a business. You can't be a businesswoman or let's say you can't be a nurse who happens to be a businesswoman. You have to take on business as a specialty so that you are a businesswoman who happens to be a nurse. Yes. So that you take on learning business the way you would take on learning critical care, emergency nursing, psychiatric, advanced practice. You take it on as a specialty. So now you take the classes that are needed. So, you know, I, I popped up my company rather quickly to meet a demand and an opportunity. And then I had to refine my company to actually incorporate to actually get an accountant, to actually set up a, a, a business account. So I jumped in and then uh, built the plane around me, so to speak. I was flying while I was building. <laughs> yes. um, but, but I had to learn how to do that. So I started reading and subscribing to the, world, to the um, Harvard Business Review and speaking to other um, business folk and, you know, developing a relationship with my accountant and my banker. And, you know, picking the best corporate structure for me, because in this great United States, there are many ways to be incorporated. So and then, you know, you really have to lean into your whole idea of service, customer service, value, flexibility. Um, you know, uh, entrepreneurism is not a structured venue. Right. <laughs> it, is, it, it is chaos wrapped up in professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> hey, which we are so used to anyway. So that's right. like one of our things that we are used exactly. to doing. So nurses, so if you if you're thinking, you know, what was my barrier? My barrier was me. I had to to I had to unlock my thinking about structure, policy, procedure, protocol, algorithm um, to say you need this class when you bet I can do it, and then stay up all night and put that class together so I could do it. Mm. You know, so the, you know, you, you have to, um, reinvent your thinking, certainly grow your mindset, um, stretch yourself in all new ways. But if you have the heart for it, it's a lot of fun. I'm doing this 29 years. I'm having the time of my life. I know that's, I mean, I'm telling you when I saw you on LinkedIn, I was like, oh my gosh. And you have such a glow on oh, you. you and you can tell that you're very passionate about what you do. I think it's the Irish red do. skin. It's just, that's what you're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I'm, I'm excited about this because I mean, I do, I, I mean, I've been in the profession for over, I mean, at one organization, 22 years, but beyond that, about mm -hmm. 32 years total. And um, I've always had this thing in me that wanted to do something more. Yeah. than what I was doing. And so the passion is there, but the instruction, that's why this is really blessing me just listening to you today. So thank you so much for sharing. Now, if we have any other um, nurses that are looking to be a nurse entrepreneur, what would you give them some basic steps that they can do? So you, you, you want to make sure that you're very clear about the service you're offering. You can't be everything to everyone. You, you do have to start small and grow. Okay. So I started in the education venue, all right? And then uh, when all of the cross-training monies that were available during managed care dried up because the cross-training was no longer necessary prior to that, and here's the difference about thinking as a businesswoman and not as a nurse, about a year or so prior to that, you could start to see the handwriting on the wall that those monies and the need, that market was drying up. So I started looking for the next thing. Because had I not looked for the next thing, my company would have closed. So the next thing for that at that point for me was legal nurse consulting. I was about 20, 20 plus years into my profession. I was certified clinically. I had all this experience and I thought, um, yeah, I'm going to try being an expert witness. And I decided to specialize in defense. I only do defense. And I started studying that specialty and then grew my business to encompass that service. So I've been a legal mm. nurse consultant specializing in defense now for about 18 years. 
And, you know, out of that then comes the speaking engagements and the guest speaker here and the lecture there. Then, of course, social media happened. And I had no clue what this was. I am a child of the 50s. Social media, (laughs) what are we talking about? (laughs) So that's when you have to hire someone and you become the student, you know. And for me, I was hiring 19-year-olds, 20-somethings to come in and set up my computer and set up my LinkedIn and set up my YouTube. And I don't do my own video vi- videos. You know, I, I um, hire somebody to do my videos with me. I do some videos and then hire them to edit. So you yes. have to bring in people, you know, even if you are a me, myself and I operation as I am, you have to bring in talent when talent is called for and you can't hesitate about that or you're not going to grow with what's needed. Um, but it's an awful lot of fun. And then you start laughing. You know, I have 12,000 followers on Twitter. That's awesome. I have six, <laughs> uh, 600 followers on YouTube. You know, I have about 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. You know, so um, I just love sharing that because there are many 20-somethings out there that are like, you know, wow, okay, okay, let's just wait just a minute here. Talk to me about them. And And then I challenge them. I'm like, you know, there's an awful lot that's needed out there. You need to lean into the technology. Telemedicine is here. It's not coming. It's here. Now, what are you going to do with that? You know, yes. and what great app are you going to invent or develop to contribute to the body of nursing knowledge to, to really answer the need for access and equity? Um, this is, this is your generation's challenge. My generation's legacy was to get us from, you know, three year hospital nursing education programs all the way through associate baccalaureate masters. And now 6% of us are, you know, uh, we're prepared at the doctorate level. That's my generation's legacy. So, you know, you can think of nurse entrepreneurism, but you can also think of what else do you have that you can leave as a legacy, you know, that other people then can build on. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. You know, as um just listening to what you're saying, I also recognize when I was looking at your website that you do some um training in, in civility as well. Is that right? That's my specialty. I am really pretty obsessed about creating healthy work environments. I I don't think um I, you know, behavior is is a funny thing and I think part of my my affinity for that is my my uh, psychiatric um, social worker background and my 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 preparation in psychology and sociology. But if you take an ordinary emergency department nurse and you say to that person, "Do you want four gunshot wounds or one behavioral health patient?" They're going to take the four gunshot wounds. You know, mm-hmm. so they because we don't understand behavior enough. What we what we need to do is really understand behavior, especially aberrant behavior, because many of our colleagues in the professions have behavioral issues and mental health challenges, and that doesn't make them damaged. It just means you want to expand your knowledge so you don't have any unconscious bias around that. Right. But when it comes to civility in the workplace, leaders have the the, the the new the new mandate for the 21st century is to create the healthiest work environment possible. And yes. that means that you're going to need to understand, effectively assess, and then effectively manage the issues of bullying and incivility. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of our leaders and our organizations fall short. Yes, absolutely. Do you think um, incivility and bullying actually is driving some of the turnover? I, 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 I think that incivility and bullying pre-COVID, I think incivility and bullying was reflected in staff engagement scores. It might be reflected in your inability to, you can recruit, but you might not be able to retain. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was reflected in there. Post-COVID, what I am hearing from across the country um, is that I'm, I, I'm reluctant to go back to the, the office, regardless of whether it's nursing or any other profession, because that person's still there and I'm not going to submit myself to that again. Wow. So if, if I, part of the, what they're calling the great resignation is, is a great realignment. What do I want to do with my life? Um, and really have 
more meaning and control over that, the growth that we got from the COVID response experience. And part of it is, you know, the, the, the reluctance to return to toxic work environments. So yes. I might just, you know, if I can't have something that's more hybrid where I'm, you know, maybe three days in and two days home or something along those lines, well, then I, I may walk away from my current position and find something that is um, less toxic. It's people are not reluctant to go to work. They are reluctant to go to work in toxic work environments. Absolutely. You hit that right on the nail. I mean, the nail right on the head. And um, I mean, because, you know, just being in healthcare, you do see it, unfortunately. And we just started addressing some of it just recently. And um, at the risk of so many people leaving, I've seen so many people leave because they didn't want to be there because of a certain person. So thank you for that. Now, Phyllis, it has been amazing. <laughs> to have you here. And I hope that you come back because you're so full of wisdom Aww. and knowledge. And uh, I definitely want to lean in a little bit more on how you started your business and things like that. And I know some other people may want to know that as well. But as we end the session, I always ask my guests the top three then I leave it open. I'm actually leaving it open. Whatever your top three, it'll be like Phyllis's top three. What would that be? Top three pieces of encouragement, little nuggets, something okay. that you would like to highlight. And then after you give us the top three, you can tell us a little bit about your business and how people can get in touch okay. with you. Well, I, I think the top three is don't undervalue. Number one, don't undervalue yourself. Please don't tell me or anyone else, or especially yourself, that you're not smart enough or good enough to do anything in this planet. Again, if you've gotten through a baccalaureate degree in nursing, you can take on the world. Um, number two is take, you know, understand that your compassionate nature is a gift from the universe and therefore you have to treasure it and protect it. Um, you know, the, the givers are there, but the takers are out there as well. And you want to make sure that you have healthy boundaries around your compassionate nature so that you stay either fully recovered from burnout or that you lower the risk that you will burn out. Okay. And uh, I guess my, my third would be um, more of a, an appeal to the nursing leaders across the country to really make a healthy work environment job one. Um, many nurses and other caring professions are, are starting to realize the value and the need for not making self-care an added value nicety. It's an essential piece of what we do. Um, if, the, if your staff is doing personal work and they're becoming that much more resilient and having a greater sense of well-being, then you must make that work envir environment match that. You can't ask people who are feeling good about themselves to then work in toxic work environments that are ruled by incivility and bullying um, and, and expect them to stay. The, the you know, the, the staff has, you know, a lot of people want to talk about post-traumatic stress after COVID. What I'm seeing is post-event growth, that the, the, the experience of responding to COVID-19 really, we found out we were stronger than we ever could be. And we found out that we are more self-reliant, that we are more creative. And you, if, if that's what your staff is feeling, and trust me, they are, then you as a leader have to grow your leadership abilities exponentially to match that or you're going to bleed talent. So I, I really hope that we have a, a new group of nurse leaders coming in because this is a time for to really grow and anchor our leadership ability within this profession. That's wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit, Phyllis, of how people can get in touch with you and um, actually a little bit more about your business, if you can, and just the way to contact you. So, um, well, thank you for that opportunity. The name of my company is MFW Consultants, Michael Frank William, MFW Consultants. Um, and you can find me, mfwconsultants.com is my website. You can reach out to me on email, uh, which is mfwconsultants at gmail.com. But I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Everything can come forward with that. So if you just type Phyllis Quinlan uh, into LinkedIn, I will pop up and then you can connect with me and we can message doing that. So I do have a full service 
uh, uh, consulting firm. I still do a lot of cross training, a lot of leadership development, a lot of motivational speaking, keynote speaking. Uh, I am a professional coach certified by the International Coaching Federation, and I am growing my coaching uh, services exponentially. I, I happen to be the career coach for AORN, which is the Perioperative Nurses Association, and also the career coach for ANA New York State. And I'm just thrilled to have that opportunity to talk to so many nurses. And I, I just want to applaud those two nursing associations for having the vision of adding professional coaching to their benefit package, which is a real encouragement for nurses to be able to seek help as opposed to, you know, feel as though they're, if they ask for help, they're broken. No, if you are seeking help and assistance, that's a sign of strength. And I really applaud those two nurses associations for fostering that. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being on When the Moment Chooses You. I have been tremendously blessed, and I know all of the people listening are going to be blessed beyond measure. So thank you for your expertise. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you're doing for humanity. Uh, I am inspired, deeply inspired, and I definitely will be connecting with you as well. I hope so. Don't let it make it too long in the future. I hope we connect very soon. <laughs>